Hello and welcome to our webinar, webinar, Spring Adult Faves. I'm Susan McGuire, Senior Editor, Collection Management and Library Outreach, Adult Books at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Links to today's slides and a title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download these at any time by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Alexa Waco, editor and publicist at Soho Press, Stephen Mac Jones, whose book Dead of Winter publishes May 4th, Melissa Nicholas, Director, Library Marketing at Hachette Book Group. Julie Hernandez, Senior Director, Wholesale Sales at Hachette Book Group. And Femi Coyote, whose book, Lightseekers, publishes March 2nd. First, we'll hear from Alexis Waco. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I'm Alexa Waco, Editor and Publicist at Soho Press, and I'm going to jump right into it. Um, um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Soho, we actually have three imprints. We have a teen imprint with YA titles, a crime imprint with crime titles, uh, most of which I'll be talking about today, but also a, so a press title, sorry, a press imprint with literary titles. So if we can skip ahead. Um, the first book I want to talk about uh, briefly before I'm joined by a very special guest more later um, is Annie and the Wolves by Andromeda Romano Lax. This is on our literary imprint and it actually came out last week so it's already on shelves so you might have heard of it. Um, but this is uh, Andromeda is a long standing and award winning author her debut you might be familiar with was a Spanish bow, um, followed by the critically acclaimed novel behave and then the award winning also uh, novel plum rains in Annie and the Wolves. Um, this is a book actually centered in a, both a contemporary timeline and also an historical timeline. And Andromeda first got her start with historical fiction. Um, she's an historical fiction author by trade, but she's found a niche in speculative and historical and contemporary, the blending of all of those things. So if genre bending is your thing, I would definitely suggest checking this book out. Um, specifically, Andromeda writes about experience rooted in womanhood. And this one in particular is about female revenge. Um, the shortest, most fun pitch I can think of is Margaret Atwood meets A. Yes, buy it. Um, so Annie and the Wolves follows historian Ruth McClintock, who's obsessed with Auntie, Annie Oakley. She's lost her fiance, her PhD, a book deal, and she's just about to finally give up the ghost when she receives a 20th century journal she's been searching for, a journal that claims to be an account of Annie Oakley's long lost psychotherapy sessions. Um, this is the subject of Ruth's fascination, um, this particular kind of mystery surrounding abuse Annie experienced at the hands of a foster family that, that she survived. Um, and you know, intermingled here is it, there's also an incredibly relevant, interesting narrative to a real life campaign to arm every American woman with a gun. So you see a bit of Annie's life, you see a bit of Ruth's and they collide um, when with together, sorry, as uh, as Ruth, as she delves into Annie's life, um, she begins to have these out of body experiences that may or may not be time travel and starts to unravel a mystery of her own related to her sister's suicide and an impending tragedy that she may be able to stop. So even though I used a lot of words and plot lines to describe this book, it is kind of indescribable. I would highly recommend it though for anyone who loves literary fiction about kind of any topic related to trauma or womanhood in general. And before we move on, a quick note that it also contains um, a really relevant storyline um, in Annie Oakley's POV, which is her real life battle with William Hurst, who was the, you know, the mega, uh, mega media celebrity and powerhouse um, of her time. And it kind of has a lot of resonance with the Me Too movement and a lot of things that we're seeing today. So this one is highly recommended, but we can jump on to the next slide. Great, so I have a crime title for you, a really like 180 degree from, uh, 180 degrees from Annie and the Wolves, certainly, uh, Slough House by Mick Heron. 
So you guys might have heard of Slough House if you're into spy fiction. Um, and there's so much to say about British writer Mick Heron that it's really hard to know where to start. But the very brief headline is, is that a lot of people say that Mick Heron is the lay Corey of the next generation. In fact, it's kind of already here, really. He is without a doubt one of the greatest spy writers working today. And this book is actually out today. So happy pub day to it. Um, if you you're going to see, I hope, Slough House pop, pop up in books media everywhere you look. There was a great AP profile of Mick that just came out and a lot more on the way. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the series, this is actually the seventh in series that follows a group of disgraced MI5 spies headed by the irascible Jackson Lamb, who will do anything to get back into the game. It's not only smart and it's actually hilarious too, but it's also a very prescient, prescient espionage series um, with Mick having intuited the rise of the alt-right and even Brexit. It. So if the books weren't so funny and filled with memorable characters, they would almost be unbearably sobering just because of how on point a lot of the criticism is. Um, instead, they are a guiltless anecdote for our times, somehow providing mirthful respite and also politically engaged reading at the same time. And last but not least, the series is currently being adapted for Apple TV, starring Gary Oldman as Jackson Lamb. So we have that to look forward to in, I believe, 2022. Fingers crossed. Next slide. Great, another awesome crime title for you guys. Hopefully some of you are familiar with this series by Sujata Massey. Um, the, this is the third installment, The Bombay Prince. Um, this is a fantastic Agatha and Edgar award-winning mystery series set in 1920s Bombay, India. But for those of you who aren't familiar, this incredible rich historical mystery series is based on India's only, or for, sorry, India's first female lawyer. Um, the character's name is Purveen Mystery. As a woman, she finds herself in delicate situations that traditional detective and police don't or won't have access to. And in this latest installment, she is compelled to bring justice to the family of a murdered female Parsi student, just as Bombay's streets erupt in riots to protest British colonial rule. Um, this particular installment is set in 1921. Um, Edward VIII, the Prince of Rail Wales, is arriving in Bombay to begin a four month tour. Um, however, the Indian subcontinent at this point in history is chafing under British rule and Bombay solicitor Purveen Mystery isn't surprised when local unrest over the royal the royal arrival spirals into riots, but she's horrified by the death of one Frenny cutting master, an 18-year-old female Parsi student who falls from a second floor gallery just as the prince's grand procession is passing by her college. Um, Frenny had actually come for a legal co consultation just days before her death, and what she confided in Purveen makes Purveen suspicious that her death was not actually an accident. So she's feeling guilty for failing to having help Frenny, so Purveen steps forward to assist her family in the fraught dealings of the coroner's inquest. Um, then Frenny's death is ruled a murder. Praveen knows that she can't rest until she sees justice done. So even if you're not a mystery fan, I would recommend this as an accessible and rich historical read. It's very accessible, but at the same time, also thoroughly rich in detail. Sujata's background is a, is a she has a journalism background, so it's incredibly well-researched. Um, and also, um, this, there's also a, kind of a, a twin storyline where as kind of the riots get more and more, you know, uh, outright and, um, you know, dangerous for, for people in general, Praveen also has to be concerned for the welfare of her own family while balancing this murder investigation. So that is The Bombay Prince. Next slide. Awesome, another kind of 180 degree departure, um, Summer Fun. I'm really excited for this one. This is one of our literary titles. I know I'm bouncing back and forth between crime and, and literary, but um, bear with me. So I'm really excited about this one, Summer Fun by acclaimed author, Jean Thornton. Um, new to Soho Press, but not new to the literary world. And this is an epic singular look at fandom, creativity, longing, and trans identity. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the plot. Um, it's about Gala, who is a young trans woman. She works at a hostel in Truth or Consequences, a real place, um, in New Mexico. It's kind of a dusty, dead-end town. Um, and she, but, but Gala herself is obsessed with a band called the Get Happies. They are the quintessential 1960s California band, helmed by a resident genius who, in the book, only uh, goes by the letter B. Um, there, you know, it's not based at all in actual fact, it's more of inspiration, but you'll definitely recognize a counterpart in Brian Wilson in kind of this Brian Wilson-esque figure in B. And here are some of the questions that circle in Gala's mind. Why did the band stop making music? Why did they never release their rumored album, Summer Fun? 
So the form of the novel takes shape as Gala writes letters to be. They sh these letters shed light not only on the get happies, but they paint in an extraordinary portrait of Gala. The peril narratives of B and Gala form this dialogue about creation of music, identity, self culture, and also counterculture. And what I personally love about Summer Fun is that in a way, you know, much of it does take the form of this mostly one sided epistolary novel. And it's really difficult now, I think, to do an epistol epistolary novel with so many in existence, but Jean completely completely reinvents the form. So highly recommended if even if the word epistolary, you know, kind of gets you excited, I would really recommend checking this one out. Um, this is a brilliant and magical work of trans literature that marks Thornton as one of our most exciting and original novelists. And next slide. So I'm so happy. I'm going to let um, Stephen take over in a second, but I'm so happy to be joined by Stephen Mac Jones today, the author of the upcoming novel Dead of Winter. Um, he, Stephen Mac Jones is a published poet and award winning playwright and a recipient of the prestigious Hammett Prize, Nero Award, among many other distinctions. I don't want to take up too much more of his time. Um, he was born in Lansing, Michigan, and currently lives in the suburbs of Detroit. Dead of Winter is the third novel in his Detroit set August Snow series, which I hope some of you are familiar with. Um, and it features uh, crime fiction's mightiest hero, ex-cop August Snow. So without further ado, take it away, Stephen. Well, hi folks. It's um, good to be here. I, I hope my hair is done well for you. Uh, Dead of Winter is again the third uh, entry into the August Snow uh, series uh, that I've created. And um, I wanted to up the stakes uh, with Dead of Winter. For those of you who are familiar with August Snow, he is a former Marine, um, ex-Detroit cop thrown off the force. And um, He's of mixed heritage, which is simply to say that he's Blacksican uh, or African American and Mexican American. And he lives in a section, an actual section of uh, Detroit, Southwest Detroit, called Mexican Town. Um, he simply wants to live in his parents' home. Uh, his parents are deceased. And he just wants to be left alone because of the trial that he went through uh, that branded him a sellout, but it awarded him, the trial awarded him $12 million. So he's just been busy um, taking care of his neighborhood, bringing his neighborhood back to life. Um, but he always seems to get pulled into uh, some intrigue. This time around, it's the deadly cost of gentrification, which involves a local billionaire, uh, the acquisition of a block long family run uh, food, Mexican food business, um, and missing dollars and a shady organization that um, is trying to recover $10 million of their missing dirty money. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I, I think you'll find it not only intriguing, I hope you find it intriguing, but also you may find a few good recipes in there because August does like his food. And that is um, a summation of Dead of Winter. Obviously it takes place in winter, a mid Midwestern winter, um, which I don't often see uh, mysteries taking place in, um, but I think it's the perfect time because good guys and bad guys hate cold weather. So they're intent on doing what they have to do quickly and efficiently. And uh, that is Dead of Winter. By the way, as far as the car on front, that is an Oldsmobile 442. 
uh, which August was gifted by his friends. Uh, and my father used to build those in Lansing, Michigan. So thank you. I appreciate it and love being here. Okay. And Stephen, I, I may be breaking the rules of the webinar here before I hand it to Melissa and Julie, but you buried the lead a little bit. I just do want to give you a shout out because August Snow is currently at some stage of development for television. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, August Snow has been acquired by uh, Imagine Studios, which is Ron Howard. Um, um, Gaspin Media, and also uh, ABC. Uh, so with the executive producer being um, Keegan-Michael Key of the old Key and Peele show. Uh, and Keegan will play the part of August Snow. So we're looking forward to that. It's, it's a great team they've assembled along with uh, screenwriter um, Paul Eckstein, who's responsible for um, uh, Law and Order, Criminal Intent, The Godfather of Harlem on Showtime, and Narcos um, on Netflix. So I'm very happy about that. Thank you for reminding me of that big news, Alexa. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alexa and Stephen. Congratulations, that's amazing. All that plus recipes, beautiful. All right, next we will hear from Melissa Nicholas and Julie Hernandez. Melissa is the Director of Library Marketing at Hachette. Melissa is in three book clubs, bragging, and is always game to talk about books. During the pandemic, Melissa has discovered her inner birder and spends free time in Central Park looking for owls from a very safe distance. Successful owl sightings are typically followed by more reading. Julie is the Senior Sales Director at Hachette Book Group overseeing the National Library Wholesalers. Julie is an avid reader and can spend hours telling you about what she is reading. She's also lucky she gets to work with Melissa and share the love for and importance of libraries. So take it away, Melissa and Julie. Hi, hi, I'm Melissa Nicholas. I'm delighted to be um, here today with all of you. I should also say that Julie and I, Julie is in one of my book clubs with me and um, that's pretty terrific. So again, joined by my colleague, Julie Hernandez and a, a little while in a few minutes, um, author Femi Coyote. And that is very exciting. Today I have the privilege of introducing Mulholland Books and a selection of spring faves. Julie will jump in to tell you a little more about two upcoming books and then onto the center stage with Femi. And Femi's going to share more about his new book, Light Seekers, and how he came to write this timely new novel. Mulholland publishes crime novels, thrillers, police procedurals, spy stories, and more. Books you will stay up all night to read and stagger through your next day, eager to get back to the pages. And your patrons won't be able to put these books down either. And so I see an upside. Your books will be returned to your branches early. Mulholland, oh, next slide. Thank you. Um, Mulholland recently published Blood Grove by Walter Mosley. Fans, please note Easy Rollins is back in this new mystery. Joey Day's fifth book in the IQ series, Smoke, is due later this month. This is my brother Polly's favorite series. Looking ahead to April, we have new books from Wallace Strobe, Wallace's Ride or Die, New Jersey, and both Julie and I are here for that. Jonathan Ames, uh, ha, um, Jonathan Ames, A Man Called Doll, is a noir novel about a private detective named Happy Doll. Next slide, please. The Adrenaline Continues into May. Ben Winters, author of Underground Airlines and Golden State, has a sweeping new thriller about a 16-year-old who suffers from a neurological condition that has frozen him in time, entitled The Quiet Boy. Also look for new books from David Swinson and Joe Lansdale. And I'm looking at you, my TLA, TLA friends, for Joe. And as I turn the screen over to Julie, sharing our thanks with Booklist for hosting today, especially, especially Brianna, who has the patience of a saint, Susan and Donna, our wonderful hosts, it's, um, and Grace, who's keeping track of us all. Thank you. It's a treat to be here. Thanks again for listening and over to Julie. Good afternoon, I'm Julie Hernandez, and it's a pleasure to be here with you virtually, even though I can't see you. 
Um, I'll be presenting three exciting upcoming Mulholland titles that I highly recommend. The first um, is You'll Thank Me For This by Nina Siegel, goes on sale March 23rd. Um, this is a psychological thriller based on the Dutch practice in the Netherlands where teens are blindfolded and dropped in the wilderness and they need to find their way home. It takes us into what happens when a survival weekend in the woods goes horribly wrong. It's an intriguing, exciting, and entertaining look inside an exotic practice that seeks to counter-program the modern practice of helicopter parenting. It is for fans of Adrian McKinty, The Chain, and Megan Abbott. Next, The Others by Sarah Blau goes on sale April 27th. This is a timely thriller, great for fans of The Perfect Nanny and their recent bestseller, which I love, The Push. It explores the dark side of motherhood and is based on the women of the Torah that were considered childless. Single and child-free herself, author Sarah Blau wrote The Others expressly as a feminist thriller, examining the modern child-free movement through the ancient Jewish histories of women who chose a life without children, for example, Miriam and Lilith, and many others. And last but not least, we have Light Seekers by Femi K.O. on sale March 2nd, and who I'm excited is with us today. In this literary mystery, a respected Nigerian psychologist travels to a remote southern border town to uncover the truth about the murder of three university students. It's a thrilling and atmospheric mystery and an unforgettable portrait of the contemporary Nigerian sociopolitical landscape. Light Secrets is a wrenching novel tackling the porousness between the first and third world. And interesting enough, the protagonist Philip has written his PhD thesis on mob violence in the American South. Much of his interest is in the murdered students known as the Creaky Three stems from his research of racist lynching in the United States and though this novel is set in Nigeria, it will certainly resonate with American audiences. Now here is Femi K.O. himself to tell you more about it. Over to you, Femi. Hi, everyone. I, this is so weird. I'm, I'm at least, I think, about 10 hours away from everybody. Uh, it's about close to 10 p.m. here. And so please bear with me as I try to recharge my brain and remember what life seekers is about. <laughs> but it's such fun to be here and I just want to share my journey to light seekers and I'm looking forward to some of your questions and some interactions and being on this panel with everybody. Next, please. Well, the, the issue is that um, um, light seekers was inspired by a real life horror story. Uh, for some of us that uh, don't know about it, necklace killing is a lot more common around the world. And necklace killing is really just the whole idea of vigilantes putting old tires around victims and basically burning them alive. And uh, it's a very horrific thing to witness. And when I was growing up, I, I remember that I never actually saw a necklace killing, but I did remember waking up, going to school and passing by dead bodies of suspected armed robbers that were killed in the middle of the night. Um, and you can just see all the charred bodies and then you walk past it. And you know, my, my mother used to say, look away, look away, look away. So it really was inspired by real life horror, but nothing is compared to what happened in 2012 when four university undergraduates, and you can see their picture right next to you, good looking, very healthy, sort of like from very middle-class, upper middle-class homes, Four young boys were undergraduates from a university were killed uh, by a vigilante on the basis of the fact that they were suspected to be armed robbers. So this sort of sparked outrage all over the world. But I promise you, I just could not sleep. Every time I thought about it, I just could not sleep. I just it just kept running over and over in my mind, and I kept on thinking to myself. So after this happened in the village. What happened after this happened in this town? Did the neighbors high five each other and say that was a job well done? Or did we really catch them? Or we'll do it again next time? Or did they keep quiet and everybody pretend that nothing happened? And it just kept on playing in my mind. Um, next, please. So this fascination led to my inspiration in a sense. So I was quite taken by 
Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. And I'm sure you all know uh, it's really a brilliant book. And, and I felt that I would like to write a nonfiction novel based on the Alu Four. That's what those four boys were called then, because the, 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 the crime happened in Alu, a town called Alu, and the four boys. So it was called the Alu Boys. So if, actually, if you actually Google it now, it's mind blowing the amount of information that you're going to get. So there were many reasons why this was a bad idea for me to write a nonfiction story. And one of them was that um, I always had this issue about profiting from the trauma of victims or the survivors of, 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 of trauma, so to speak. And if you, if you remember some of you guys that have actually studied Capote's um, history and his journey, you can see that this is one of the things that he actually struggled with, that he actually had to... to to reconcile the fact that his fame and his fortune was coming from, uh, from a very tragic event that he, he had reported. So I had a bit of an ethical issue with that. There was also the logistical challenge of living in Namibia and studying in the UK and writing about Nigeria. And because it was intended to be my MA thesis in creative writing, uh, the university also had some ethical issues in terms of how to do research, the approvals and all of that. And I just could not picture myself going out to look for approvals and consent forms from over 300 um, murderers, let's call them what they are, and, and the victims' families. So I had to abandon the idea and I decided to go the, function, uh, the fictional route uh, because I was fascinated by the systemic issues that may have contributed to the prevalence of vigilantes in the countries like Nigeria. And I'll talk about this idea of systemic issues because I'm a big fan of system thinking and, uh, and how I approach it. Next, please. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, my story is, has been called complex and called multi-layered, but actually it's a very simple story in my head. You know, uh, it's about a guy called uh, Philip Taiwo who has been called by a Nigerian, um, very powerful Nigerian whose son has been killed, was one of the um, boys that was killed in some kind of a mob, mob violence in the remote town of Potakot, and he has no idea that he's about to be enveloped in a perilous case that is far from cold. So this thing happened two years ago, and this is my hero that is just coming back from the US, a very reluctant returnee, so to speak, and he's an investigative psychologist, and he has been an academic all his life, and just before he came to uh, came back to Nigeria. He was in the internal affairs of the San Francisco Police Department. So his job really is that he's an investigative psychologist. He's an academic uh, that's more interested in figuring out the why of a crime than actually solving it. Uh, so essentially, as soon as he lands in the town, he's, it's a whole different world for him. And then we'll talk more about the town and the airport more later. But with the help of his loyal and streetwise uh, personal driver, Chica, uh, Philip is able to sort of like walk against all the cons all the uh, um, characters and the environment that is working against him uh, to try and find out not just what happened, but why did it happen? So his investigation pitches him against several obstacles, many informed by the circumstances that came together to make the crime possible in the first place, but consistently there's the imminent danger of the true source of the violent act, which is a damaged and dangerous villain that is a master of, at manipulation and mayhem. So next please. So really what I was very interested in in this story was really just trying to look at the humanist part of the story. I, I, I am a Nigerian that studied in the US and I live in, the, in Namibia. And I also um, was doing my MA at that particular point in the United States or in Europe as some people would say. And um, for me, it was very important to find a story that connected humanity, that had some kind of a universal experience. So it was very important to find parallels and um, some kind of a fundamental human experience that everybody could connect with. So at that particular point in time, the Black Lives Matter movement was gaining traction across the US and across the world, to be quite honest, after um, George Floyd. So when I started the novel, and for some reason, the song Strange Fruits kept on playing in my head. And you can 
and seeing some of the visuals that I put there, um, whereby people are actually hanging from trees, or black people, to be quite um, clear, we're hanging from trees in the South. And the idea of outsourced violence and the weaponization of prejudice um, started taking hold inside me. The idea that you could actually use people's prejudice and people's ideas and their biases and actually turn it into a weapon of, of violence was very, very interesting to me. And I think that was when the pilot led me to create my hero, Dr. Taiwo, who, um, despite the fact that he studied in the US um, uh, and had an academic pedigree and was able to hypothesize and theorize around human behavior, he still remained horrified at what was happening uh, in the US in the past, uh, with the lynching in the South and in Nigeria, in specific, specifically around Okriki. So his academic interest in mob violence and lynching of the Blacks in the South uh, resonated when he was ap uh, approached to come and solve this case. So those parallels were what led to my other parallels. It was important to show that the concept of it can never happen here or it's us and them uh, is the kind of separatism that allows us to look at a terrible act in one's culture or society with passive judgment as a form of escapism. So we, I experience it all the time here when I'm watching CNN, when I'm watching all of this, uh, what you can call uh, Western media as to how we, we report Africa and we report um, what you can call uh, less developed or evolving um, economies where people just look at it and say, oh, it can never happen here can never happen here. And it does happen there. And actually, you know, it happens everywhere. You know, it just happens in different ways. And these things are happening all around us in different ways. Sometimes they involve from the past lynching to both police brutality in the US or are inspired by the now radicalization by social media. So the more parallels I was drawing, the easier it became to write a somewhat universal story that just happened to be situated in Nigeria. Next, please. So um, the title of the book is called Light Seekers and light is in the novel is a metaphor for truth and knowledge, uh, as we all know, and how this can change shape and perspective. Uh, the mental fragmentation of the, of the villain is also dramatized through the metaphor of light and dark. This is the reference to the broken system that allows such a heinous crime, necklace killing in this case, to be perpetrated with little or no consequence to um, to the perpetrators themselves. And however, this is also much more a localized nuance. I don't expect you guys in the US to understand it, but um, in Nigeria, for instance, um, we produce 2,400 plus megawatts of power against a demand of over 12,000 megawatts. So in essence, I think I lived my whole life in Nigeria with less than one hour of electricity in a week. So that gives you an idea. And electricity in Nigeria is described as light. We don't call it electricity. We don't say, oh, they're taking electricity. We say they're taking light. So a significant portion of the action in the book happens during blackouts. And I try to heighten the tension by literally dramatizing the frustration of groping in the dark for answers. Next, please. So I also created a returning hero with new eyes uh, because it was important for me to understand this crime that I have come to appreciate with my home country and I needed to see my own country with new eyes because I was not living there. So I created a hero that would ask the kind of questions that I needed answers to and I needed to have the same ambivalence that I had about my home country and in the process regain the love that I, I needed to have for my country because I am going home at some point in time. The fact that he's also not a professional investigator also helped him to allow him to make the same kind of mistakes anyone would make in such a setting. And I think it made him more accessible and more every man in the most fundamental fundamental way possible because he had empathy. At the heart of it all is the psychologist uh, that he is. He's an investigative psychologist and he's not a clinician. It's very important. And this means that he might have insights into the human mind and its pathologies, but he's not equipped to diagnose or to treat. And first and foremost, that he's an expert at uncovering 
motivations and explaining crime after the fact. You cannot prevent crime. And ensuring that the solving and the investigation of such a crime is unbiased towards the innocent while being ethically fair towards the guilty. So it's the kind of guy you want on both sides, you know, whether you are the prosecutor or you are the accuser, you want him on your side. And uh, the popularity of other psychologists Kevin, is also encourage this because um, I'm a big fan of Alex Cross and Alex Dedaway. And of course, my favorite, which I grew up with, is the Naked Face, Dr. Jude Stevenson. I'm a big fan of Sydney Sheldon. Thank you very much. Uh, next. I'm about to finish now. I also created a villain that has a split personality, which is a symbol of a broken system. Um, the villain is... Uh, the villain is a product of a broken system. Uh, he's not. He's not. He's not just a product. Sorry, he's not just a product of a broken system. But he's rather is my metaphor for that system. Um, the abuse he experienced um, when he was growing up um, is reminiscent for me as the ravaging effects of colonialism, while his punishment in the hands of monks and religious leaders uh, uh, is to highlight the insidious nature of religion in post-colonial Nigeria. The split personality became in my mind an allegory for the split system that exists in Nigeria, and the same people who could welcome strangers with open arms go to church or mosques every day of the week, but the very same ones that could watch another human being born. So uh, therefore, I, I see characters as settings as interrelated systems, each with unique component parts that collide with each other, unpredictable, and then they create another unpredictable unique system. It's not a simple action then reaction. All systems continually interrelate and are constantly changing. And a system is fraught with insecurity, um, poor infrastructure, failure of leadership, unregulated social media, outdated legal structures and poverty, and so much more is a recipe for what happened in Alu and by extension in my novel. Next. So the world that I created for me was became a character in the story. If I was looking at everything as a system, I can see from the visuals there, if you've read the novel, for instance, you can see the airport on the right side. Uh, that was the old uh, Potakot International Airport. And you can imagine the top picture. And that is how people go into the arrivals and that's where they pick their luggage. And I actually, uh, after I finished writing the book, Last year, the, um, the, the Air Force was renovated to look like the bottom picture that you can see there. On the, the left side, you can see the traffic jams. And you can see the police officers are standing there at a, tra a traffic point. Uh, you know, you can also see a police officer receiving bribe right there. So I've read some of your reviews of Light Seekers. And uh, for me, what always comes to me is that everywhere I go, they say, it can never happen here, for instance, in the US, it can never happen in the UK. And I beg to differ because as far as the crime is concerned itself, I believe that it can happen. And um, in my Nigeria, the country is beset with poor infrastructure, high corruption, and definitely presents unique op opportunity to tell a very different kind of crime story from what the ones that you're used to or for the ones that your readers are used to. So to do this effectively, I needed to make the setting and environment go beyond a world in the history sense, but as an actual character that determined a lot of the action and reactions of the other characters. So my world that I created is a vibrant and active and alive system with its own component parts, which again combines with other systems to bring forth an unpredictable emergent system. So it was the perfect recipe for drama to my mind. And my last slide, I think. So what I then did was to create parallels in the world of light seekers to create some kind of a universal story. Um, the movie rights for the book have been optioned by a brilliant producer in the US. He's one of the producers of um, the Broadway Hamilton. And his words at his pitch uh, to me was, I read the novel and although I was transported to a remote far away place in Nigeria, I could not help but feel as if I was reading a story that was unfolding before my eyes in the US. And two weeks later after that conversation, the infamous insurrection at the Capitol Hill happened. How quickly public sentiments can be influenced by social media was made manifest before the eyes of the world. And in that regard, I knew in my heart that I had written a truly universal story. And I hope that your readers, the people that borrow and the people that ask for your recommendation will be able to see this. Another parallel of interest in the issues of cultism in Nigeria um, 
is that the literature in terms of cultism and uh, fraternism. So I'm hoping that you guys will be able to see that and you'll be able to understand how it works. Um, so I think my time is over now and thank you for giving me your time and I'm open for questions later and I can expand on some of the things that I've spoken about. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Femi, and thank you for staying up so late for us all the way in Namibia. Um, and thank you to Melissa and Julie. So now that we've heard from Alexa, Melissa, and Julie about some amazing titles that we can all look forward to, and from Stephen and Femi about themselves, about their stories, we're going to transition into the panel portion of today's webinar, led by Booklist's own adult books editor, Donna Seaman. So Donna, Stephen, and Femi, please go ahead and unmute yourselves and start your videos. And Donna, take it away. Thank you so much, Susan. Hello, everyone out there. I have a light in my face. Um, hi, Stephen and Femi. Thank you for being here. Um, so interesting to hear your takes on your book. There you are. Hi, Femi. Um, so I love origin stories. And I was reading a little bit about each of you. And I was struck by the fact that you both worked in advertising. And I wondered how that affected your literary dreams. Was it you had to work before you could get published? Um, what you learned in advertising that applies to fiction? Stephen? Um, well, yes, I was in advertising for a little over 30 years, advertising, marketing, communications. And whenever I say that, I feel like I should light a novena candle <laughs> and, and uh, ask forgiveness um, for selling people such useless things. Um, that being said, um, one, of the, one of the best things to come out of my experience in advertising, marketing, communications, was the fact that um, I learned to rewrite um, quickly on the fly. Um, and based on the fact that if, if I wrote a commercial or a print ad, um, radio, TV, what have you, um, before the internet, that's how old I am. <laughs> Me too. Um, but you know, I could write something that I thought was pure genius and the client would think it was, well, crap. So I had to learn to rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And um, as uh, there's that old saying in uh, publishing of kill your darlings. Um, yeah, it, in advertising, it killing your darlings became essentially mass murder. Um, so the the fact of the matter is that is what I took that discipline from uh, those years in advertising, marketing, communications. That is a discipline that helps me now. Uh, rewriting, editing, re reinvigorating uh, an idea, a concept. Um, and that's, that's as far as I'll go as far as advertising. Yeah, thank you. I figured it was trial by fire one way or another. Femi, you were in advertising? Right. I am in advertising and ah. you are in one of my favorite, favorite brands that's called Macan. And I can understand why you felt that you were selling useless things because Macan had the Coca-Cola account for so long. So you were pushing sugar to people and um, you were also selling MasterCard. So you were pre right. pushing credit cards. So anyway, but I am still in advertising and I am with a network called Publicis. And it's one of the largest networks in the world. And I, 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 I actually agree with everything that you've said and the discipline that advertising is giving you, the ability to think on your feet, the ability yeah. to be able to, you know, get it going 
And most importantly is that you also develop a very thick skin because you're constantly getting rejection Absolutely. on a daily basis. So uh, <laughs> for instance, when I sent my manuscript out to agents and some would say, no, so this is not for us. I am cool with it because I get it every day, exactly. you know, so, exactly. and all that. So that really worked. But one of the things that I have noticed that advertising really did for me was, especially when you're developing a story like August Snow, for instance, is the ability to think like a brand because a brand is a character, you know, and it's so beautiful because when I do presentations and I'm doing workshops with other writers, you know, I always find out that I'm all constantly thinking within the consistency of a brand world. And that is something that advertising people bring to the table in the literary space is that we're constantly thinking as a brand. So the ability to create worlds is so consistent with our, with our belief system, so to speak. But, it, uh, but it's also, it's also um, an opportunity to bring back humanity to that brand. Uh, mm -hmm. bring back that compassion um, to what you would call your brand. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's one of the central things for me as a writer uh, that I feel good about. I mean, yeah. you know, I could care less about the type of motor oil or automobile that I used to try to sell you um, because you're trying to infuse some sort of, of identifiable soul to that product, uh, which mm -hmm. can be very weird. Um, but when you create a character, it, it's, it's the brand of the character, but that brand is based on uh, Human heart, the heart, yes. the soul, the mind. Um, yes, Donna. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but don't so, give away the secrets of branding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I'm hearing, listening to you both, is branding, but really storytelling. I mean, you have to yes. grip people's attention, and yeah. so you know whatever you're writing about, you're storytellers, um, and so that's a, a skill that's much more difficult than it might seem, and. So I'm wondering how you, so Stephen, you write poetry, you're a playwright and you write crime fiction. Can you talk about, you know, what you bring to each of those forms and um, what they well, mean to you? Um, as far as poetry, um, I love poetry. I love reading poetry. Um, uh, you know, Langston Hughes and Seamus Haney and Pablo Neruda and and whole bunches of other poetry and and I at one time wanted to be um, a poet um, because I love I love how poetry teaches you the weight and color and smell and feel of a word. Um, uh, the gravitas of a single word. And it makes you choose words uh, more carefully. Um, but I had a poem published in the Atlantic Monthly. That was, that was years ago. Um, and that was one great poem out of about 15,533 really awful poems. Um, so it's, it's tough to be a good poet. Uh, if somebody gave me the opportunity, uh, they said, Steve, we'll give you um, a week to write a really great poem. Or will give you three months to write a book. I would take the three months to write a book any day of the week. Um, my hat's off to uh, poets. As far as playwriting, I had uh, 
two plays produced, uh, both dealt with uh, African-American um, Vietnam veterans. Um, playwriting taught me the propulsive nature of dialogue, um, how dialogue can reveal and how dialogue can conceal. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed playwriting, but uh, uh, I'm not practicing that right now. Um, but yeah. yeah. Thank you. So oh, Femi, oh. are there other <laughs> are there other literary forms uh, beyond crime fiction that inspire you? Uh, okay, uh, well, I, I, I started out on stage. I, I wrote a lot of stage plays. Um, and uh, I went to USC and I studied script writing. Uh, so I have a background in, in, in screenwriting. Right. And all of them come together in my, in my book. And then I'm really very, very pleased with, for the first time in a very long time, I feel that my creative output is a, is a harmonization of everything that, of my journey, so to yes. speak. So I, can, I actually don't see a difference in everything. And I was very excited when you talked about the idea of storytelling, whether it's brand, whether it's script, whether it's... Uh, um, a novel is all about storytelling and about holding the attention of the reader or the audience or the watcher, you know, uh, to tell it. And that's what I'm, 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 that's what excites me about what I do now. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to do this at this late stage in my life. Oh, let's, let's not talk okay, wait, about then. that. <laughs> oh, no, don't go there. I don't go there. Don't go there. You. I got you beat. I lost my <laughs> hair before you. <laughs> All right, you guys. Let's talk about your protagonist. Um, Stephen, let's talk about August Octavio Snow, who you are getting to know very well because this is the third book yes. about him um, and his world. So can you talk a little bit about his sources? And well, his um, I saw in the chat portion, uh, there was a question uh, from April, I believe. Hi, April. How's it going? <laughs> um, addressing August's um, mixed race. Uh, he is half African American, half Mexican American. And um, that was a deliberate choice on my part because uh, those two minorities are the largest minorities in Detroit. And you can go from East Coast to West Coast and you can find that you'll find that most black communities and brown communities don't really get along that well. And I wanted to show that through August, well, somebody got, got along really well. Um, <laughs> the truth of the matter is uh, August is extraordinarily comfortable in his multiracial skin. Um, he feels he has the best coursing through his veins as far as food, uh, food culture and literature and the appreciation of art from his Mexican American mother and his sense of, of ethics, duty and honor from his black Detroit cop father, uh, both of whom have, have passed. Um, so, um, he does not, uh, I'm sure we've all seen a variety of forms that we've had to fill out. Um, you know, please give us your ethnicity, race, white, black, da, 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 da. And then at the bottom, there's other. Well, it gets really tiresome being the other. Uh, that, that other category forces you to say, well, what am I? And 
that is a category that that whole section is a category that that August would choose not to fill out because he knows what he is and he's confident with it. Other people may see a black guy or they may see, hear him speaking Spanish and think, oh, he's Mexican. Um, August is proud of both based on a love of his parents. So, and in a lot of ways, I think um, August, though he does get into hairy situations and finds himself in sometimes morally, ethically uh, dubious situations, um, I think he wants to stay on a true North path. Um, but as with everybody in this life, and I mean everybody, um, well, let's think of it this way. If you take off from Detroit, if you're flying from Detroit to Oslo, Norway, that plane does not make a straight line from city to city. Along the way, there are course corrections. Um, a multitude of course corrections. And that's the kind of center that August has. Um, and frankly, it's a center that's put to a test like I've never tested him uh, before uh, in this third book, Dead of Winter. Indeed, indeed, thank you. Finley, let's talk about Philip, your academic who finds himself having to also be very physically courageous too. What are his sources? Well, I think I took so much time during my presentation that I think I talked a lot about him. Um, so um, I would take questions about him, but I think what I needed to add based off what um, Stephen was saying is the idea that this character is sort of a, a, a part of me in a sense because he really, while he maybe does not look like me or sound like me, he's he, he has the same kind of curiosity that I as a person have about humanity and about what is going on around me, about the environment and all that. And so that that makes him for me a very special person because it becomes almost like a tool in my eye, uh, in my hands to ask the questions and sort of like investigate and see what the kind of answers will come, uh, will come back. So this is the first book with um, Philip Taiwo. Um, the second book is going to be researching or, or finding out why uh, the, the, the wife of a big mega church evangelistical televangelist um, would disappear and then die and the pastor is being accused of, of killing the wife. And how does this happen in a religious setting? And uh, what, so he's asking, and uh, when I think about that story, I think about my own questions where faith is concerned and where religion is concerned. And mm -hmm. I've, I've heard a lot of people actually ask me these questions like, how do I have to know about Nigeria before I enjoy uh, Philip Taiwo, and I'm like, no, you don't have to. You know, he's a he's a global citizen. He he's actually just asking human questions, the kind of questions. So in in the second book, he's asking about about religion and, and about faith and about the sense of atheism versus you know believing that there's a god. In the first book, he's asking about the kind of cruelty that is that humanity is capable of which is very similar really when you think about it to the cruelty of, of, of um, Nazi camps, for instance, or, or, for, or for the Rwandan genocide, for instance. So those are the kind of things that I want to use Philip Taiwo, my protagonist to do, so I can understand the world better. And like I can be a better person at the end of the day. So it's a tool in my hand. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad there will be more books with Philip. That's really 
Um, very exciting. Um, I cannot believe we have like run out of time. I wanted to talk to you about the communities you portray, uh, <laughs> which are both such vivid microcosms. Um, so maybe we'll take just a minute. Stephen, just tell us a little bit about the community, about August's feelings about his community. All right. Um, August Snow lives in uh, Southwest Detroit. Uh, which is known by its moniker Mexican Town. There are a variety of Mexican restaurants and bakeries in this area. Uh, it's predominantly uh, Mexican American. Mex Mexican Americans have been in this area of Detroit for close to or over 100 years. Uh, so the roots are deep. Um, I, I wanted to address the fact that um, this is not the Detroit that um, is a stereotype of, you know, sparks on an automobile assembly line, and it, it's nowhere near being um, the the um, just it's it's not the destroyed landscape that uh, is the shorthand, uh, the stereotype for Detroit. <laughs> yes, there are problems, but I wanted to, for as much as I want people to learn about and love and question and be surprised by August Snow, I want them to uh, learn about question um, be attracted to and re repulsed by a Detroit that they don't know. Uh, so uh, both, both August and the city have their own personality. Yeah. Uh, every city has its own personality. And I'm, I'm trying to communicate that. In an entertaining, so fashionable way. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, this was so wonderful to speak to both of you. We 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 need to get back together and continue the conversation. Um, congratulations to you both. Thank, Thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn it back over to Susan. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. I've never been so unhappy to have you turn it back over to me. That was fantastic. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you, especially to Stephen and Femi. And let's all give it up once more for Alexa, Stephen, Melissa, Julie, and Femi for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you all so much. It's been truly a pleasure. Yay. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. So Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Donna. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. Be well. All right. Now, now the brief business part at the end. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and the video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones, like the ones you see here. And if you haven't already, be sure to check out the Booklist Reader, where Booklist contributors post about the latest book news and reviews. If you're not yet a subscriber, pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar. One more thank you to our sponsors, Soho Press and Hachette Book Group. And this concludes today's webinar.